Okay, welcome back to members of 121 Community Church in Grapevine, Texas. Our ongoing study in Paul and Jesus by James Tabor, published in 2012. We're going to look at our final lesson in the series. We're going to take a look at pages 223 to 237. We'll take a look at the independent and the historical Paul. Last lesson, we took, at the, uh, took a look at the uh, dramatic apostolic split between Paul and James the Just. And now we're going to take a look at uh, the continuing legacy of the movement of Christianity in Block 1. We know that Paul increased as James decreased. The death of James in A.D. 62 contributed to the de decreasing influence of the Judaic Christianity movement. And then two, the Old Testament being translated into Greek as the Septuagint also helped influence the popularity of Paul's Gospel. The destruction of the temple in A.D. 70 also was a contributing factor. And then uh, Simon, who succeeded James for leader of the Jerusalem church, fled northeast and consequently the Judaic Christian movement scattered and became dispersed. And that resulted in the Judaic Christian movement evolving into many different varied sects uh, such as the Ebionites and the uh, Nazareans. It split up into a, a group of uh, smaller organized groups after it being dispersed to the north. We know of the Ebionites, we know of the Nazareans, there were a few others as well. Now Jewish sectarian Christianity, every one of these uh, smaller divisions held four things in common as fundamental convictions. The, the eternal validity of the Torah, They only recognized the Gospel of Matthew and written in Hebrew, by the way. They considered Paul a heretic and an apostate. And they said Jesus was not divine, but he was the political Messiah. He was not a divine Messiah come down from heaven. These basic principles were held by all sectarian divisions of the uh, Judaic Christian movement. Now, the Ebionites... They used the Q document of the sayings of Jesus. They perceived Jerusalem as the house of God even without the temple. They were closely linked to the Jerusalem apostles. They did accept the Didache and the letter of James, in addition to that Gospel of Matthew. But basically, after the Judaic Christian movement, it split into these smaller sectarian divisions. And Paul's Gospel continued to gain in popularity. Now, if you take a look at Block 2, it just Professor Tabor gives us a little glimpse into the historical Paul. He says the German scholar Bauer began the investigation. He posited the notion that there are four Pauls in the New Testament. You have Paul's 13 letters plus the book of Acts, which give us 14 texts that depict four different Pauls. And they are the early Paul of uh, 50 to 60. That includes Galatians, Thessalonians, Corinthians, and Philippians. The disputed Paul of 80 to 100, primarily uh, the books of Colossians and Ephesians there. The pseudo-Paul of 90 to 130, which would be First and Second Timothy and Titus. And the legendary Paul, which would be the book of Acts. Four different uh, views of Paul across uh, four different uh, time periods. But the historical Paul comes from the 13 genuine early letters. They mention the apocalyptic urgency. The later letters do not. The book of Acts tries to harmonize Paul with Jerusalem theology, which is a false perspective. So Professor Tabor says that Acts must be used with extreme caution. But from the 13 older genuine letters, we can gather the following uh, historical aspects of the historical Paul. He was a Hebrew. He was a Pharisee. He was a zealot. In AD 37, he had a vision of Christ. He made three visits 
to Jerusalem. He claimed receiving direct revelations from Christ. He had a physical disability. He performed the signs of apostleship. He was unmarried. He suffered various persecutions. He worked as a manual laborer. And he was imprisoned and eventually executed. So we do get uh, those 12 aspects of the historical Paul. But we'll close up by looking at block three and looking at Paul's actual beginnings because some of the things that we assume about Paul really were not the case. There's a second century document entitled The Acts of Paul and Thilka, which gave us a description of Paul as small of stature, bald head, crooked legs, eyebrows meeting together, nose slightly hooked, and friendly disposition. And then two, Jerome of the 4th century wrote of Paul concerning his birth, that he was not born in Tarsus, he was born in Geshala of Galilee, 25 north, miles north of Nazareth. He was born prior to 4 BC because in 4 BC, Paul and his parents were exiled to Tarsus. He was born in Galilee, exiled to Tarsus. And Geshala of Galilee was a hotbed of revolutionary activity against Rome. Paul was not born a Roman citizen. And in AD 60, Paul writes to Philemon, and he says uh, that he is uh, the old man. So, so we don't know how much before 4 BC Paul was born, but uh, in AD 60, he's at least 64 years old or older and refers to himself as the old man. But he was exiled to Tarsus. He was born in Galilee, okay? Exiled to Tarsus, born in Galilee. So that gives us a better and more authentic definition from the historical perspective. But as I said, our last lesson on that apostolic split really was the conclusion to the entire project by Professor Tabor. This just wraps up a few additional historical facts, and we're not going to belabor the point any further. This gives us some additional historical information. Uh, basically, you should review that prior lesson. The penultimate lesson is really the conclusion to his entire thesis. But we will wrap up here. This is uh, the conclusion of the book at page 237, and uh, we will pick up with our next study.